How's it going, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages? It's Rob. Welcome to Let Me Talk My Talk, Episode 5, NBA Trade Deadline Edition. Um, before we get into the trade deadline discussion, I just kind of want to let you guys in on my creative process a little bit, or how my mind, how, how I'm wired. So anybody that knows me knows I love to listen to podcasts. Listen to them in the shower, listen to them when I'm cleaning snow off the car, listen to them in the car. First thing I do when I wake up in the morning, turn on the shower, turn on a pod. So, but when big NBA news breaks, I shut off pods. Like, I don't listen to any pods until I write down my thoughts and get my stuff recorded because I never want to feel like somebody else's thoughts influenced mine on the subject um so if so when the rockets trade happened uh two days before the deadline i immediately have to write down my thoughts because i don't want what i see on twitter or what i hear from a national uh writer to affect my thoughts on the process so today is Friday, a day just about 24 hours after the trade deadline, and I spent most of the day at work taking notes on all the trades, um, writing down just my quick first impressions and my thoughts, and then after I put this video out, I'll listen to some podcasts and see what other people thought. But the point is, I never want my thoughts to be tainted by somebody else's, and I never want you to listen to me and then listen to somebody else and be like, or listen to somebody else first and then hear me and be like, oh, Rob stole that thought from them. I need to know in my heart of hearts that if you were to ask me about that, no, that was my thought. I didn't listen to them first or I didn't read anything first because in order to be really good at this, I want to do it genuinely my way. I want my brain to be what these thoughts are, whether they're right in the future, they're wrong, you agree, you disagree. I want people who listen to me to feel like, hey, at least I know these are his thoughts. He's not stealing from somebody else. Also, just on my creative process while we're on it, these are my nasty handwritten notes. <laughs> About three pages front and back um, with every trade listed, and I just jotted down my thoughts so that I have them here. Um, thanks for listening to this little rant about my creative process and how I'm a podcast addict. So the first big trade we had was on Tuesday, the 4th, and it was the Rockets, the Timberwolves, the Hawks, and the Nuggets. The Rockets um, acquired... Robert Covington and Jordan Bell. So I'll just give my thoughts on the Rockets and I'll work team through team. First, the Rockets are going super small ball. Um, Mike D'Antoni has said in the past that he wishes he kind of would have went all in on small ball with the Suns back in those days. And it seems like he's really shooting his shot here with it. They're going to go Russ, Harden, Eric Gordon, Covington and PJ Tucker. That's really small, but in theory, you can switch everything. It's a lot of shooting. And I think it opens up a dimension of Westbrook that the Rockets didn't previously have. With, with this lineup, you have four really good shooters and Russ, or four good shooters and Russ. So you can put them around Russ, and Russ can do driving kicks. Now you need Harden to buy in to playing off the ball more, but it just works so much better if you let Russ be the primarily primary ball handler in this situation because with if you roll reverse and have Harden as the primary and Russ is still out there, you don't have they don't have to respect Russ as a shooter. So you get more help, and it's clogged. Um, this is a small team and their top six rotation guys, uh, if you add in Austin Rivers and Ben McLemore, so their top like seven rotation guys 
are all small. They haven't used Tyson Chandler much this year. It's really switchable in a lot of shooting. And it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the playoffs. If Dan Tony can get Harden to come off the ball a little bit more to allow Russ to have four shooters around him. It should be fun. I'm excited to see what the Rockets do. Um, I, w- I had a really strong Jordan Bell point, but as you're going to see later in the video, he winds up getting traded, so I'll save that for then. Um, the Timberwolves uh, got Malik Beasley and Juanez Her- Juancho Hernandez Gomez, e- Evan Turner, and Jared Vanderbilt, as well as the Nets' first-round top 14 protected pick. Whew, that was a lot to unpack. <clears throat> All right, let's start with Beasley is a great pickup for the Timberwolves. He's a restricted free agent this year, this upcoming summer. So that's going to give the T-Wolves about 30, 35 games to look at him to see what kind of offer they want to give him or do they let him go out into restricted free agency and just go or are they going to match? So... He's cool because he's on the same timeline as Towns and eventually Russell. Um, Wancho can shoot. He's fun. There wasn't a ton of minutes. Um, Denver had a log jam of just players, so moving on from some of them is is healthy. Evan Turner, I expect to get bought out. And there's already rumors of him going to the Celtics. I think if things don't go right with Darren Collison for the Lakers, they should take a look. Um, Another ball handler, another playmaker. This is actually going to be a theme. If things don't go right with Darren Collison for the Lakers, there's um, another player that I'm going to bring up later that I think they should take a look at that's on the buyout market. Um, So a top 14 pick that's protected from the Nets via the Hawks is something else that the T-Wolves acquired. They're not going to get that pick this year. So what I'm wondering is, does it roll over to 2021 and it loses more protections? Um, If it's not conveyed this year, does it become a second? I'd I'd really like to see what the language was on that between... um, the Hawks and the Timberwolves, like what is going to happen with this pick? Um, The Hawks get Clint Capella and he got a raw deal in Houston. Like D'Antoni wanted to start moving towards something smaller. So they got rid of the five. He's going to be awesome with Trey Young. Trey Young gets a really fun pick and roll partner. Who's a rim protector who can make up for some of uh, Young's noted defensive liabilities. And then, do you guys remember what it was like when Harden first unlocked Capella? Um, Through the legs, bounce passes for two-hand hammers. Like, Capella's fun with a point guard who's willing to throw dimes. And Harden has regressed from that lately. So, seeing him with Trey Young, who's honestly one of the most exciting players in basketball, is really cool. Nene was also a part of the deal for the Hawks, and I'm going to assume he also gets bought out. Is he somebody the Celtics want to look at? He's a big, he's not quite as big as a real big, but he's like 6'9", and he's burly, and he plays tough, tight interior post-defense. Well, in the past he has. I don't know how much he has left in the tank, but if the Celtics are still looking for a big on the buyout market, He's a name to keep an eye on. And then the Nuggets. Denver didn't want to lose Malik Beasley for nothing at the end of the summer. If he signs a ref- if he signs a restricted free agency sheet, they're already paying their backcourt Buku Bucks. They have Jokic, Gary Harris, and Jamal all making good money or set to make good money. And then they have Michael Porter Jr. um, sort of waiting in the wings. So they were probably going to have to let Malik Beasley walk no matter what happened. Therefore, they traded him, got some assets. They got got the Rockets' first-round pick this year. The Rockets 
always trade their first round pick. Um, I might actually put up a graphic right here of all the first round picks the Rockets have traded away. Um, so they lose Juan, uh, Jesus, Juancho Hernan Gomez, who was playing about 12 minutes a game, and Malik Beasley was playing about 18 minutes a game. So that's 30 minutes a game that is now just opened up, and you figure some of it was getting more minutes for Michael Porter Jr., who's playing about 14 minutes a game now with the... The removal of those two players, I could see him getting up to 22 minutes, maybe. That's like eight more minutes in the stud rookie that you guys are trying to groom while still being a contender. Moving on to Wednesday, February 5th. There were some trades this day. Mainly, Dwayne Dedman was traded from from the Kings to the Atlanta Hawks for Jabari Parker and Alex Lynn. I'm just going to make this real quick. The Kings suck. They signed Dwayne Dedman this summer for three years, $40 million, And by December, he wants a trade. And because he voices that trade and lets the league know, hey, I'm voicing this trade request, the Kings lose all leverage and have to give up two second round picks to get rid of him. And in return, they get Jabari Parker, who normally I'd say, hey, Jabari Parker is still young. He's 24. Hey, Jabari Parker has pedigree. He went to Duke. He was the number two pick in 2014. This isn't bad. Take a gamble on him. Not this time. I'm out on Jabari. I've been riding with Jabari for so long. When he was coming out in the draft, there's tweets, there's podcasts. Yo, Jabari Parker is the real deal. He's in the Carmelo Anthony, Paul Pierce frame of score. Man, I was wrong. Jabari let me down. So I'm not riding with him on this. Next up, we have the Sixers and the Warriors making a trade. The Warriors um, get three second round picks. They avoid the repeater tax and they're grabbing assets to make a war chest, which now includes a $17 million trade exception. So for those that don't know, the repeater tax is they would have got banged even harder on money for for being over the salary cap two years in a row. Um, it's you incur bigger penalties. I want to say it's two fifty two dollars and fifty cents for every dollar you're over the cap. But when you're talking millions, that gets outrageous. So by getting rid of Little Big Dog, a.k.a. Glenn Robinson III, and Alec Burks, they avoid the repeater tax. And for six for the Sixers, they get some much-needed shooting in theory. Um, Alex Burke, Alec Burke this year is 37.5 on eight three-pointers a game. And for his career, he's a 36% three-point shooter. And Glenn Robinson III is 40% this year on three three and a half attempts per game and 37 for his career. So we're talking about guys that in theory can space the floor around a Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid pick and roll or maybe a, I don't know, man, the Sixers are confusing. Um, a Horford Simmons pick and roll. They're just adding more shooting but I don't think what they need is shooting, really. Like, shooting always helps. You can never have enough shooting. I think they need somebody who can consistently create their own shot. And Tobias Harris ain't it. Tobias Harris, to me, isn't... He can't be the best shot creator on a championship team. I'm not even asking him to be the best player. Like, that's clearly Embiid, then Simmons. But... Ideally, you want one of your two best players to be able to create his own shot. And neither of them is particularly good at that. Like, Joel is cool, but having to feed the post to get, like, your best shot sometimes isn't ideal. When you can walk the ball up, you just hand it to your best player, and then now they have the ball, and it's not, they're not relying on somebody else to get it to them. 
it, it takes a lot of pressure off and it avoids unnecessary turnovers. And I don't think Tobias Harris is that guy. I'd even go as far to say that the Sixers might be the favorite to win the chip had they kept Jimmy instead of Tobias. I understand that Tobias is closer to the Embiid Simmons timeline, but that only matters when like you're building something. This is a title contender now. I think they may have dropped the ball on this one. Next, we have the Grizzlies and the Rockets made a trade. Um, initially, when the Rockets got Jordan Bell, I thought, I see what you're doing, Mike D'Antoni. Okay, Daryl Morey, you take Capella's money and turn it into Covington, and you can go all in on your small ball lineup. But then you bring in Jordan Bell, and if he can give you 75 80% of what Capella gave you, it's not really a loss. Like, you want Jordan Bell to be a vertical spacer and a good screen setter. That's not bad. But then the Rockets traded him, so I don't know what Daryl Morey and them are thinking. Um, the money, I, I looked up what they're both making. It's similar enough that it didn't offer any cap relief. So, I don't know. One, the next is one of the bigger trades of the day. The Warriors traded D'Angelo Russell, Amari Spellman, and Jacob Evans to the Timberwolves. So the Timberwolves could get... Uh, off of Andrew Wiggins' contract, but most importantly, they bring D'Angelo Russell and reunite him, or re, they unite him with Carl Anthony Towns, who is one of his better friends in the league, and Russell is insurance to keep Towns around so he doesn't leave in five years or four years because this is year one of the contract, and they're just making whatever move he wants because they think he's going to leave even though he's under contract for the next four years. But, yay, Minnesota! Feel bad for my boy D-Book because it's a little-known secret that Booker, Russell, and Towns all want to play together. And now two-thirds of them are together, and D-Book can't even get into the All-Star game. So, sorry, Book. Um, so, we're about to go on a little culture rant. This is culture. The second... Wiggins becomes a warrior, I start thinking, damn, third, fourth option, Wiggins might kind of be a height. Like, he doesn't have any real leadership roles. He's not, he doesn't need to carry the team. He could be better defending, worse shooting Harrison Barnes in theory. He's surrounded by three Hall of Famers. Um, they have a championship culture. Like, that is culture that... A dude who's a number one pick who's struggled is now with this team and all of a sudden you think you start think you see the silver lining all of a sudden. That's culture. D'Angelo Russell is with Cat and now you can run a lineup of Russell, Beasley, Culver, Hernan Gomez, and Cat. That's fun. They're all relatively on the same timeline. And, like, you get to see what you have. So that's my thoughts on Mini and the Warriors. I do want to talk about the protect the top three protected pick that the Timberwolves sent over. So if the pick is one, two, or three this year, the Timberwolves will keep it. But if it's anything past that, the Warriors get it. And now we're starting to see the Warriors build a dangerous war chest. They're going to have their own lottery pick. They're going to have the three picks they received from the Sixers, the three second round picks. And then they potentially could have the fourth pick. So two lotteries, a bunch of seconds. So now you can add two lottery picks to Steph, Draymond, and Clay, Or... You can turn two lottery picks or one of those lottery picks and some other things into the next disgruntled star this summer. So it's just something to keep an eye on. Like this rebuild has happened fast. And by next year, the Warriors should be back barring injuries. Yo, nobody move. Y'all know what time it is. Who am I kidding, man? This ain't me. 
I don't work for the Cavs, but that's how the Cavs gave it up. They just walked into Detroit and said, yo, this is a stick up. We're taking Andre Drummond, but we'll leave you Brandon Knight and John Henson. Cavs just said, like, I'm not the biggest Drummond guy, but I know what a fleecing is. They just stole Drummond, just straight kidnapped him. All right, so I hope you liked my little, uh, thought I'd throw something silly in there, get Remy on camera, he likes that. But back to the Cavs, I hope that adding Andre Drummond makes a Tristan Thompson buyout more likely because I'd love to see Thompson go to the Celtics and bolster their front line. I was, originally I was like, maybe he's a candidate for the Rockets, but the Rockets just don't want players that aren't, Six not uh, that are over like six seven and can't shoot threes. Um, maybe the little bit of cap difference between Kabokolo and Jordan Bell is for the Rockets to make a Tristan Thompson buyout pitch, but I don't think so. So Boston needs a big. We're talking about a proven vet here. Let's uh, let's start the Tristan Thompson to Boston campaign early. The Grizzlies and the Heat struck a deal. Uh, the Grizzlies were able to offload disgruntled Andre Iguodala. Once he moved on to the Heat, he is rumored to have signed a two-year, $30 million extension. Then he got on TV talking all this corny, uh, I was a persecuted black athlete stuff. And I just can't roll with that. The Warriors traded you. So be mad at the Warriors. The war You signed with the Warriors and they moved on from you and sent you somewhere where you didn't want to be. And you took it out on the Grizzlies, like the Grizzlies, the Grizzlies wanted you. They acquired your services and all you did was pout while they sent you checks for while you stayed at home. And then you got in front of the TV and the cameras and was like, oh, as a black man, I put myself in this position and I had to deal with it. This wasn't about race. This was literally the company saying, hey, you don't want to be here. We'll try and find a suitor for you. Until then, we'll continue to pay you. You went on a goddamn book tour. So for you to get in front of the camera and race bait like that was super corny. I'm always on the side of the athletes when it's justified. This wasn't it. You want to play for championships? That's fine. You feel that you've earned the right to not play for a team that was supposed to be in the bottom of the league? That's also fine. I'm cool with all that. But when you start saying that they did this to you because you were black, I can't roll with that. Like, I, you want Harvard and HBCUs to study you holding out and being paid $17 million? That's what you're telling me? Andre Iguodala is known as one of the smarter guys in the league, is what everybody tells me. And it's what I've read. Well, this I don't think this was smart. I think this was super duper corny. Um, I hope he can help the Heat because they've been really fun to watch. Uh, they have two Kentucky guys. They have Bam. They have Tyler Hero. I have a newfound love for Jimmy Butler. So I hope that... He can help the Heat, and I wish him future success. But I thought that this whole thing was corny. I said that on the last video, and I'm here to double down on that fact again. Um, as far as the Grizzlies are concerned, they get Justice Winslow. Um, he's been pretty banged up this year, but when he's healthy, for the Heat, he did a lot of ball handling. And I'd let, I'm interested to see how the Grizzlies are going to use him. Are they going to use him as a backup point guard where he can facilitate and kind of find his flow? So those were those two teams. And the Timberwolves just helped uh, facilitate and acquired James Johnson. J.R. Not J.R. Smith. Deion Waiters was included to the Grizzlies. And I think he's a Lakers buyout candidate if... Darren Collison doesn't come through because he can handle the ball and he can create his own shot. And outside of LeBron, that team is scarce on that, especially from guards. You have Rondo, who's a passer. Um, Kuzma is essentially a big. AD is a big. 
Dwight is a big. McGee is a big. Um, Caruso is cool, but I think I'd rather have Dion Waiters as a breaking case of emergency. And character issues don't really matter for Dion Waiters because most people, uh, character issues do matter, but playing with LeBron, people normally shape up. I think of J.R. Smith a lot, his time in Cleveland. Playing with LeBron, he was able to be probably the best J.R. we've seen, or at least the most mature. And I think that LeBron would have a similar effect on Deion Waiters. So that's just an idea. That's somebody to keep an eye on. I don't have any secret intel. It's just how my brain works. And the last big trade of the day was the Clippers, Wizards, and the Knicks. The Clippers acquired Isaiah Thomas and Marcus Morris who has now officially become the better Morris brother, better Morris twin. I don't know when that happened, but it's a thing and it's real. He'll give the Clippers more depth at, like, he's like a power swingman, I guess. He's somewhere between, like, a three and a four. He's, like, a real tweener, but he can shoot. I don't know if he's great defensively, but he's gritty. He gives you, he's one of those guys who you're not going to punk him. Marcus Morris is no chump. Sometimes it's to the detriment of this team because sometimes sometimes you should just kind of wear it and not get the technical, but that's not him. So it's a toughness. It's a grittiness. He's kind of a goon. Like, he's skilled offensively, but still, for lack of a better term, Marcus Morris is with the shits. Isaiah Thomas will be bought out. As far as the Knicks, they get... Mo Harkless, and more importantly, they're going to get an asset. They're going to get the Clippers 2020 pick, which will be somewhere in the mid 20s, somewhere probably between like 22 and 26, if I had to guess. And the Wizards get a young guard in Jerome Robinson, who was the 13th pick in 2018. And he still has some potential, but he got buried on the bench on a championship contender. So now the Wizards are going to get a free look at him, basically. So thank you guys for watching. This has been episode five of Let Me Talk My Talk, NBA Trade Deadline Edition. Please share, subscribe, tag a few friends. Reach out to me at Shaw's Law Podcast on Twitter if you have questions. All feedback is greatly appreciated, and thank you for spending a little time with me today.